You're listening to the ProcureTech Podcast, your weekly show for all that's cooking in the digital procurement space. Yes, we've got the hottest startups, thought leadership and conversation from visionary industry experts and definitely no stiff corporate content. I'm your host, James Meads, procurement pro, digital nomad and ProcureTech fanboy. And now here's this week's show. Yes, hello, very warm welcome to another episode of the ProcureTech podcast, where every week we bring you everything that is fun and exciting in the digital procurement space. And what often happens in the digital procurement space, especially in larger enterprises, is that most of these big companies have done some form of digitization over the years, but often that has meant they've just implemented one of these big legacy suites. They've not done a particularly good job in terms of change management. And then what they end up with with is a pretty bungled, sort of half-complete digital transformation, which is really neither here nor there. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, on today's episode with my guests, because they've developed a tactical and tailspin solution, which they really see as something that is very much complementary to a legacy suite-based approach. So if you're listening along to this and you've perhaps spent a lot of money investing in one of these suites and you're not likely to change provider or maybe your company has a strategy to use a specific ecosystem that matches and ties in with your ERP, not naming names, then this solution can really complement that and make sure that you can get the most out of your digital tools also for your non-strategic tactical and tail spend activities. And my guest today was actually a guest on the show back in September, and we're bringing them back today Uh, to do a sponsored episode because they've done some changes to their software that they're very excited to tell you about. So Henning Hatia from Lortza, a very warm welcome back. Thank you, James. Glad to be back. Happy to be back with you. (laughs) So yeah, you've been pretty busy since the last time we spoke. You've, uh, You've secured your Series A funding and you've done a little bit of a pivot in terms of your target market. So just just give us a brief intro about what you've been up to since then and and then we can sort of jump into what we were uh what we were going to talk about which is how Lotsa can really complement some of these big established suite providers with what you do. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Um so we've been we've been quite busy over the last 8 to 10 months I would say. Um since our last funding round, we've been scaling the team, especially the tech team, of course, and we've also refined our value proposition to to some extent and and uh, focused it. So, one core thing that we that we actually um, changed over the last months and what we're what we're busy with is um, really focusing on on a more enterprise um, size organizations with our solution, as we saw that loads really works best when implemented in. In existing structures, the ones that you mentioned already in the beginning, um, like SAP Ariba, for example, and not so much as a standalone solution the way we built it in the beginning, but rather as an as an integrated solution that kind of operates in the background um, of those legacy, if we want to call them legacy systems. And and that's really a a problem that everyone's looking at, you know, regardless of how well they've done their digital transformation and regardless of to what extent they're they're getting the most from the suites, most, or I'd even go as far as to say all suites don't really cover tactical spend very well, do they? Because on the one hand, they are quite cumbersome to use, but then on the other hand, just you know the the amount of effort to to go in and do an RFP through a system that you know in most cases doesn't have a particularly intuitive user experience. It's a whole effort versus benefit sort of question, isn't it? So so how is lots of different to that, and where do you think that some of the existing suites don't meet the automation or the UX requirements that that today's customer is demanding? Yes, I think on on in terms of automation and UX requirements to pick that up directly, I think none of them really meet um, any of the 
criteria or the the needs that that organizations and especially business users um, users that are spread out across the organization would expect today so th that's why we refocus ourselves a bit and and really aim at supercharging those systems supercharging procurement systems and and organizations that are already in place today with kind of two with two edges i would say one focused on uh, the, the operative procurement teams um the spot by teams uh, the tactical teams really making their life easier and 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 more efficient in, in the end and we know that many of many of the teams they have the challenge today that they don't have enough people to hire they have so much to do but they don't find the people so they need some kind of efficiency levers to be brought to their to their daily life in terms of execution and then uh, the other kind of stakeholder in in our um for our solution are of course the requesters the business users that are business users that are spread across the organization which I don't know if you've heard any business user enjoying using one of those big suites and because in the end these were made for for expert users that use it every day um that that are yeah power users in in a sense but not these occasional users that maybe go in there once a week if anything or or less even yeah and that's a really good differentiation I'm glad you raised that actually because I I you know I completely agree with you I think if you Without wanting to to pick on 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 one specifically, you know, I have actually used SAP Ariba in the past. I haven't, as a practitioner, used Cooper or iValue or, or some of the others. But I think in terms of features, they're actually pretty good. You know, to be fair to to these big suites. But the problem is just as you very rightly mentioned, it's the usability, and they're so complex, and the UX is so horrible. You know, they feel like they were put together. On a Friday afternoon, in some cases, and, and you're absolutely right that un, un, unless you're a procurement professional that that manages RFPs pretty much as your job, you know, even I had, had an example. Philips actually has a team of internal consultants that manage RFPs through uh, the the software that they're using for for that reason. That you know, that the occasional user, as you put them, even if they work in procurement, let alone, you know, the wider stakeholder, ju just finds them too complex. So, you know, I don't want to beat up the suites too much in that regard because they, they do have their purpose, especially for, for very complex tenders in specific categories. But you're absolutely right. For tactical spend and tail spend, for users that, that essentially are, are requisitioning something rather than you know going out and strategically sourcing something 100% they need a they need a system that is easy to use that's intuitive that is that is that is pretty that is, that is easy access that's low touch uh, and that doesn't require a lot of training because ultimately if they if they don't have that then that will just result in maverick spend which is often a reason that I guess organizations complain that digital transformation has failed. Exactly. I think what I did what I did want to ask you though is the logical challenge I would give you is then why wouldn't you then just just connect a bunch of punch out catalogs with something like Cooper or Ariba or Jagger or or one of these big suites? What where, where is the gap between what Lortzer does and and what and what a punch out catalog Uh, running into one of these suites can offer. Well, in the end, um, in the end, it's a lot about about being able to centrally coordinate any kind of request that is happening or that is coming from somewhere within the organization. And even even when you have several punch out catalogs integrated into Cooper or into Ariba, um, which is the path that that most big uh, corporations went for in the last years, you still have the problem with. Um, A, a very suboptimal search experience, I would say, and and not really a really gui not a guided um, process in the end for the requester. So it's still um, the more you standardize, the more catalogs you integrate, the more things you try to put into your um, kind of standardized channels or, or purchasing channels, the more complex in the end it gets again for the requester to find exactly what they need because this is not yet harmonized across um, across catalogs and and across maybe also free text uh, requisitions that are a bit more non-standardized that have some service component uh, in them and and this is really where we um where we're implemented into those systems where we 
uh, where, we, where we give this kind of integration layer to combine actually to combine the process of searching for something, um, no matter if it's a catalog item or if it's in the end a free text uh, request that will go out to suppliers to get quotes. So if I give an example, then a catalog approach would work well if there is, for example, a store person that's ordering, you know, non-technical spare parts, you know, off the shelf spare parts like, you know, electrical connectors or uh, or operating supplies or, or, or PPE from a regular supplier that, that he knows is the chosen vendor for that category because they're pretty much the only one that's going to be doing that requisitioning and ordering. But if if a marketing assistant needs to go out and buy conference meeting rooms, for example, then then that's something that is essentially, well, not maybe not one-time spend, but it's definitely not, you know, repeatable recurring spend for the same specification. So that's something that 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 they could that, that they could use something like Lord Sephora to be able to intelligently search for that type of provider. For example, and I would go even a step further. I would say um, catalogs in the end. I mean, you can catalog catalogize um, the world almost. There's, I mean, you can put consultants in a catalog if you want. You can put uh, marketing um, services in, into a catalog. You you can pretty much put anything in a catalog. But um, that still doesn't solve the problem that the people that need those things or those um, services, products, so the, the marketing person, for example, or the, any kind of business user, that they don't, that's not the way they, they interact with a system um, right. to, to find those things. They, they go, first of all, what everyone does, and I think no one would challenge me on that one, is you Google it. You, you Google what, you, what you're looking for. And um, if it's a product or a service, unless, and that's maybe the exception, but that's not where we're focusing, unless uh, you are working in one very specific niche and you have maybe an MRO, you have certain kind of tools or repair parts, spare parts that you need to reorder um, uh, in, in, in very um, frequent, um, very frequently, and then I believe it's fine or it makes sense to have some kind of catalog, a custom catalog um, where you just have your framework contracts in there with a certain a set of suppliers or, or for a certain set of products. But for anything else, it's a bit more, let's say, free flow. I would say that it's not the ideal state um, to go into a rather static catalog, catalogs to search for these things in a very unintuitive and, and cumbersome, uh, cumbersome manner. Yeah, you're right. MRO is, MRO is probably the most logical example. And office supplies, I guess, is another one. But then once you get beyond that, apart from maybe peripheral IT equipment, which is perhaps a third. You're, you're right. A lot of it is very, you're moving then more into one-time spend and the requests tend to get quite unique, don't they, in a lot of cases. And and yeah, if you don't know where to buy something, I mean, catalogs are great, but if you don't have the right change management process and that's not communicated well, typically what, what happens is and I guess you will verify this as a former consultant yourself, what normally happens is a stakeholder thinks, I need to buy something, but they don't necessarily think, oh, okay, Bob Smith is the person that buys this category. They they don't think in categories, do they? They just think, I need to buy this. Exactly. And I need it tomorrow. So how do I, either, yes, they go on Google or they go to an existing website that they know, like an Amazon or an e-commerce retailer, if it's if it's something that can be bought that way. But services, it tends to be, especially it tends to be more complex, doesn't it? Hey, so just a quick interlude to let you know about procurementsoftware.site. This is a new website that I recently launched to give you, the listener, a free-to-access intuitive guide to digital procurement technology. You can filter on a multitude of different criteria and pick out a short list of procurement software solutions that are relevant to your business and your needs in less time than it takes to boil an egg. No corporate subscriptions, no complex jargon, and definitely no pay-to-play model. We are a completely transparent, open book, and we really want to get your feedback on 
what we can really do to make this user experience better and constantly improve so as we're providing value to you. Check out procurementsoftware.site. And now let's get right back to this week's podcast. So that's maybe walk me through because... I would describe catalog spend as being very much for long tail items where it's an off the shelf item. It's pretty easy to search in a product catalog if you know what you're looking for. If, if, for example, you're a stores person or a, a marketing assistant, but something that's more tactical in nature, but perhaps isn't repeatable and it's coming from somebody that, that doesn't buy stuff very often. Walk me through the process of how that would typically work in a, in a poorly managed organization? And then to contrast, how would that work with Lortza? Yeah, in a, in a poorly managed organization, it would work j- just poorly in, in, let's say, poorly managed in the way as a procurement manager or, or a CPO would say it's, it's poorly managed, um, i.e. Maverick in the end. Um, the, the, the business unit or whoever um, would be requesting something would in the end not even bother to use any kind of um, tool that is in place, be it Ariba or, or just an S4 system, for example, or Coupa, um, they would just go out to the market or, and, and search for, in their view, suitable suppliers themselves, get a quote, probably just one, and just contract the, um, the supplier. And in the end, they would say, the company would receive an invoice, which then in the end would lead to that, well, there is no PO to that invoice. So you, you have the prime example of, of Maverick Spend, which is still happening a lot today. But I would say that's not even the, that's the worst case. Let's not paint that picture because many big companies, also many that, that we speak to are a bit past that point, at least. Um, they're, they're more at the stage that you have the system and you have, um, so you have, let's say in Ariba, um, and you have requesters, business units that know, okay, we have to go through that system or we were supposed to. So what they do, they still get that first quote and then they just put it in, uh, they put it in the system as a free form uh, request or, or, or free text request or, or whatever you want to call it and say, okay, please execute this. So then the, the procurement team, uh, the, the spot buying team, for example, is only seen as an execution team kind of to just buy or, or confirm whatever the business unit requested. And we believe that's not where uh, the value add of procurement should be. It should be much, it should be different, should be much more uh, than just execution, because this is actually something a system can do today for, exactly. um, for an organization. Yeah. Because what you've and, described is essentially just, it's an administrative transactional process, isn't it? They're not, they're not even doing any sourcing, you know, even though, even though it's a very tactical activity, then they're not even sourcing from the, from what you described. They're just, they're just converting a purchase rec into a purchase order, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a repeatable task that in theory, you could just get a robot to do that. And they, they probably will in a few years time. Yes. And, and that's, that's, where, um, that, that's where we come in. We're then integrated into SAP Ariba, for example, and we take those requests. So Lotus takes those requests um, from the system automatically based on certain parameters that can be set with a customer individually depending on how they define also yeah, tail spend, tactical spend, or, or, um, or, or spot buying, um, and also whether it's certain categories that fall into it or not. And Lotse assesses this request and gives recommendations on, on actions to take to the spot buying team. So that could be either A, this actually freeform request is actually something that's in, in your catalog somewhere, so you shouldn't even you shouldn't even go out and source it uh, from somewhere else, or you shouldn't even um, contract with that supplier that someone from the from the business unit potentially identified. That's one path. Of course, then then it's a clear case. It's a catalog item done, um, or something from a framework contract. And the other way would be um, that Lutz uh, recognizes that this should be kind of this. This should be a mini tender. This should be something you source from from a preferred supplier, or a, or maybe also not a preferred supplier, a new supplier. And that's what, what Lutze does then in the end is identifying those suppliers based on the suppliers that we can search in from the from the our customers SRM system, but also additional suppliers that we have in our network, which is of course uh, an, an additional feature and and, and uh, kind of 
something that actually not many companies want to do in tactical spend because they actually rather want to consolidate their their tail and, and tactical suppliers and not expand their supplier base. But this is then what Lotse does and approaches those suppliers based on the, the decision that the that the spot buying team or the procurement team still makes to approach a certain set of suppliers that was recommended to collect quotes and then to have a competitive a competitively sourced process that's almost as uh, I would say almost as good as in, in a strategic case. Of course, it's less complex in the end. You have uh, transparency over market conditions, and uh, in the end, also you you um, kind of made use of your supplier panel more more efficiently and and actually more effectively as well because business users don't know they don't know about the suppliers that you that that you have as a procurement team that you have contracts with. They just know what they want. It, also sometimes not that, but usually they know what they want and where they get it from in the end, that shouldn't be their concern. And that's where we help. So if I just summarize then, it will it will take a requisition and it will identify whether it's it's something that should basically then just be converted into a purchase order with with the vendor that the requisitioner has put on there, just depending on the value and the criticality. Or it will that, or it will decide if it's something that deserve that, that deserves or warrants a, a bit more activity in terms of sourcing. And then, if the if the buyer doesn't necessarily know who to source it from, it has a very it it has a, a sort of basic supplier scouting functionality built into it that searches the database of of all of Lords's customers to potentially suggest alternative sources. Uh, in essence, it searches first and foremost is it uh, searches all the that particular customers um, suppliers. So um, only only the ones that are already onboarded by that specific customer, just to make sure that they can that they can enter into business without another onboarding process in between. Right. Okay. Okay. So so it is an existing vendor then. So it's not it's not going out and scraping suppliers that would then result in having to do vendor additions in the system? We can do that, but we see that in most cases, um, customers would rather stay with uh, their few already onboarded suppliers that they that they have for a certain product or service. Because our experience yeah. is that if, if you look at big corporations, they have 40, 50,000 suppliers in their system. And for any kind of request, they've already contracted uh, enough uh, to 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 fulfill it and also to get um, maybe competitive quotes to get a market overview it's rarely the case that they need really a new supplier yeah no i agree with that certainly on on the on the tail end of the spend that's usually where most big corporations are looking at consolidation rather than rather than adding sets. <laughs> I just wanted to be clear on that because yes. there are tools out there that do do supplier scouting. You know, Scout B and Tealbook are the are the obvious examples, but but that's more on the it's more on the strategic sourcing and more on the supplier absolutely. diversity side rather than tail spend. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. there it makes absolute sense and it's and it's very, very useful. And also I think something that, that strategic sourcing teams struggle with to find adequate suppliers in new regions for new facilities they have to build or or whatnot. Um, but for, for tactical and tail spend, it's more about consolidation and more about leveraging the suppliers that you already have through better use of data. And that's where that's why we have our own supplier database as well, because we're a bit more flexible in the way that we can collect data about suppliers and recommend suppliers in the end. So we have more flexibility in the data that we kind of ingest into the process compared to a typical e-procurement suite where where the database is rather static. Right. And then and what about integration then into one of these larger suites? Does it require much external consultancy or, or IT support to be able to get the two systems to to communicate or or is it something that 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 they should be able to do if we're talking large enterprises you know if they've got an internal IT department is it something that you know workload and and resourcing aside they should be able to handle themselves yes they they are definitely able to handle it themselves i mean if they have an internal um an internal team that that manages their system which the big ones all have we even do integrations for for pilots and POCs because it's just rather straightforward. 
even with uh, um, with SAP Ariba, for example. That's interesting. So you, you you can actually integrate it without the need for a for an external consulting project. Then, in most cases, that's um, yeah, that's good. Yes. It's good to know because uh, especially now in such an inflationary market, budgets are tight, right? So I mean, it's uh, if uh, if anything can be done in house, that's always a big selling point. Looking at the market that you're playing that you're playing into now. The elephant in the room is obviously ESG. All of these big corporations are putting a lot of focus now in terms of ESG and and additional compliance in that area. So, talk to us a little bit around you know how can lots of lots of pull that data from from perhaps external systems and sources like like an like an EcoVardis, I guess, is the most famous one, but but there are others as well that are that are aggregating that data. How are you able to bring that into your system so as so as that that data is not in a silo? Mm-hmm. That's a very important point for for our solution as well, because we can. What we believe in is that, like just like in for the execution part of these these processes, just like in in for decision making in the end, you need those data points that. Um, Ecovadis that Integrity Next and and others provide, you need to have them in the process and actually where the decisions are being made. When the decision to buy something or to source something from from a certain supplier is being made, these data points need to be available. And that's our kind of approach towards it, namely supercharging again the the, the process execution by implementing ESG related data and um, ESG is such a buzzword by now. There, there is some, there is such, some very interesting parts behind it uh, that really need to need to go into the decision making process. Also, compliance related data and compliance in a in a rather classical sense regarding sanctions uh, regimes, for example, a very very um, current topic at the moment. But it used to be a topic actually for years, um, not just now with Russia. Money laundering topics, ultimate beneficial owner. Um, related topics uh, to know who you're engaging uh, with when you do business. And we integrate these data points into into the process so that whenever a decision is being made to purchase something from somewhere, the requester or the procurement user, whoever is in charge in, in that particular situation, has these data points transparent to kind of imp- implement them in their, in their decision making, which doesn't make um, the, 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 which doesn't kill the need for having like an ex post assessment of your environmental footprint, of how your um, how your suppliers, how your um, supply chain is dealing with uh, uh, certain regulations and and compliance uh, yeah, regulations. But it helps you to it helps you to have kind of directly an impact while while doing it, and not just uh, kind of from the policy perspective, from a governance perspective around it. Yeah, and I've I've always said, I mean, I, I said it originally about supply chain risk, but it also applies to ESG that in most big companies, you're going to have a pretty good handle on what your top 100 suppliers are doing. But if they're going to get caught in any in any scandals or in, in any issues, it's typically going to come from the long tail because obviously they're the suppliers that are not being actively managed. So whether whether we're talking third party risk or supply chain transparency or or, uh, or or net zero, whatever part of the whole ESG, because you're right, it is a buzzword, buzzword, and it's a very wide spectrum. But you know, it's it's obviously if the, if supply, if companies are going to get tripped up, it's not going to come from the suppliers that are under control. You know, this goes for every organization. You know, even at at enterprise level, so yeah, I do. I do think that's a, a really important point on ESG, and you can use it in the end also on. I mean, long tail is and t- tactical and long tail is in the end the the vast number of of um, purchasing events that happen within an organization. It's right. maybe not the maybe not the volume driver in terms of euros or dollars, but in terms of transactions and and business relationships, it's the, it's the majority, and. With just a few kind of decisions you take, this this actually can have a strategic edge to your organization. If you say, okay, in any kind of sourcing event or in any kind of purchasing process, um, the the suppliers need to have an Equivada score of at least sixty or so. Then you can have this as a parameter in your in your calibration for Lotse, and you can already already have a better 
kind of recommendation of, of which supplies are, are actually suitable for you still or not. So that's kind of in a nutshell how we, how we think about it. And obviously there's a long way to go because collecting the data, having it up to date, that's, that's not what we do. But, um, of course we rely on the data. Uh, that's a big, uh, that's a big topic and, and an ongoing topic, of course, uh, because data points change and uh, you never know how, how reliable they also are. Um, but, yeah, but I think we're making great progress in that direction, especially due to external kind of data providers like Integrity Next and Equivadis, to just name those two. Awesome. So, Henning, thank you very much for joining me. Before we sign off, um, we're actually going to be doing a live demo of Lortza in two weeks' time after this interview is published. So I'm going to drop the link for you to sign up to the webinar uh, in the show notes Anyone that's also subscribed to our updates will also get notification of this. So if you are working for a large enterprise and this has sort of piqued your curiosity and you'd like to have a look at uh, what the process flows look like in Lortza and how the software looks uh, on the front end, then I will be moderating a demo in two weeks' time uh, from this interview date. So it will be on the uh, 25th of May. And uh, yes, yeah, sign up, join us. I will be moderating it. Henning and his team will be demonstrating what Lortza can do. So it would be lovely to have you there. What industry sectors, Henning, do you think this is most relevant to, just so as we can hopefully get the most relevant people signing up to, to take a look at this? You know, that's a very boring answer now, but we're really ag agnostic to industries just because okay. we're 90% is, is indirect spend. Yeah. So and, and, really, and it's, really it's materials really. and services as well. So if there may be a, a non-production, non-manufacturing company, it would still be relevant. Absolutely. Wonderful. Henning, if anyone can't make the demo, uh, where is the best place that people can get hold of you if they'd uh, like to get in touch? The easiest to just uh, visit our website and uh, sign up for a, for a first conversation with us and we'll be in touch to schedule a call directly. So on our website, www.lhotse.de, like the mountain. Awesome. So yeah, thank you, Henning. And Lotsa is just one example of really a bunch of solutions that have come on the market recently that are, that, that are challenging and finding solutions to tactical and, spend, and tail spend problems because, as we discussed today, a lot of the big existing suites don't really cover this space effectively. And as the Deloitte 2021 CPO survey stated, the top priority for CPOs is no longer cost savings, but is in fact operational efficiency, which, you know, touching on the ESG and all of the other deluge of governance that's coming procurement's way, it, it probably isn't really a surprise that this is finally coming into focus. So I hope this was useful to you guys. Thank you very much for listening. As always, we appreciate everyone that downloads the podcast and made us have a record month actually for downloads in April. So huge thank you from my side too. Don't forget to check out procurementsoftware.site if you want to do a comparison on multiple criteria of which is the best procurement software for your organization. Until next week, take care. Bye for now and see you soon.